Hello, my name is Bob D. Hilster, and I am your Particle Model Guru. Today's video is about the eclipse, the solar eclipse. This is part one of, the, uh, of a two-part series. And in particular, we're going to talk about what people call anomalies. I've said this before, I don't think it bears repeating. There are no anomalies in nature. Uh, we can't just walk away from it and say, oh, well, that, that, that isn't going to happen again. I don't need to worry about it. I don't need to explain it. But in my opinion, there are no anomalies. There are only discrepancies between measurements and calculations. There are only discrepancies between what we expect and what we observe. But it seems that during eclipses, many scientists still talk, say that there are anomalies. Okay, and these are th actually three examples because the LA anomaly, which I'm going to talk about, happened in 1954 and in 1959. And LA used a pendulum, and that pendulum uh, jumped around unexpectedly. And... Uh, they, and that happened both in 54 and 59. In 1997, Wang and his group were in China, uh, used a gravimeter to make measurements during an eclipse, and the measurements show anomalous bumps. Okay, what might happen? Clearly, there are solar and lunar tides, and ocean and continental tides during eclipse could cause some unusual effects. You have the, the ground or the water moving up. The lay used a pendulum. You might expect that during that time uh, uh, there's less gravity and it would change the period of the swing because it, it, as it moves up, uh, you have a slightly less gravity. Maybe it would change the period of, of the swing, but that's not what he... Uh, measured so much, or at least not reported. He reported these anomalous jumps. Wang used a gravimeter, and the measured values would ex you would expect at the start of the eclipse, the, the uh, force of gravity would decrease very slowly until the, uh, the maximum, and then increase and return to normal, just slowly go down and then come back up and return to normal. But let's see what actually happened. This is quite busy. Uh, this is the pendulum that LA used. It's free to move up here. It's got a ball, a, a, a support ball, that can walk around on this flat plate. It's not fixed in place, so it can, it can move around on the plate while at the same time the pendulum is swinging back and forth. And so normally, if you're standing there watching the pendulum, once you set it in motion, it stays in place. The pendulum doesn't really move. It's the Earth that moves counterclockwise. But since we're moving with the Earth when we watch it, we see it as the, the plane of that pendulum swinging as going clockwise. So before the eclipse, it's moving uh, clockwise, but sometime during the eclipse, uh, during the, right there around the first contact, instead of continuing to go clockwise, it jumps backwards and moves around and moves around and eventually comes back to uh, moving clockwise. Uh, that happened in both. That happened in both of the uh, of his e e uh, eclipses. And this is his reported data in 1954. The pendulum, the plane of the pendulum, was swinging at around 178 de degrees. Uh, they, they, you, you mark, you mark in the uh, uh, the circle as it goes around. You mark it in terms of degrees. So you can mark one end and you can say, well, I've set 178 and it's progressing like you expect. By the way, this is what you expect necessarily. Uh, during normal times, you don't know what to expect necessarily during an eclipse, but this is what you would normally expect to continue. 
Well, it does until the start of the uh, eclipse, and here's the maximum point at the eclipse, and here's the end. Uh, the eclipse here was, uh, in 1954, was a 67% eclipse. But sure enough, when it gets to the start, it jumps back. It literally jumps. This doesn't a gradual move. It moves from here to here. Then it gradually moves around and around, until, and then it jumps back this way. At or around the uh, max, it jumps again, and it, and it wiggles around and, and moves back up. How do you explain that? You can't, it's very difficult to explain all of those move, motion. What's interesting is the, uh, uh, it starts here on this line, and it, it appears to end on the line. It's like the eclipse never happened. It's kind of, that's interesting. In 1959, he gets a different result, and this is a 35% uh, eclipse. He's at 194 uh, degrees. Uh, the pendulum, plane of the pendulum swing at the start again. It jumps, maybe only four degrees, four and a half degrees. Again, it moves up to the maximum, comes back down. You know, in one sense, once you uh, understand that maybe it's jumping, this is much more well behaved. Uh, it, it 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 moves backwards for a period, then it moves for this way, and it comes right back to the line again as if the eclipse had never happened, but you got this pendulum jumping around. The Wang eclipse, well, what you would expect in measuring using a gravimeter is that the value is going to be a certain value until he, he has recorded here the first contact. This is totality, he had a total eclipse and this is the fourth contact when the moon finally moves away from the sun. What you would expect at when it gets to this point is to slowly go down, slowly increase to this point and out. Clearly, that's not what he got. Uh, now, now, he did uh, subtract the average value because he, he measured well before and well, aver at, well after to get an average value and he subtracted that the instantaneous reading from the average value to get these values, and this is a running sum of, of 10 points. Take 10 points, average them, and plot it, move over one point, take, take those points, add it, and he gets this dark line. That's how he did it. But this happens before the eclipse, almost before the eclipse even started. And so you don't expect this bump. Secondly, you expect this to be lower here, and it's not. It's up here, as if the you didn't have any uh, uh, whether that the sun and the moon weren't even out there. It's up there, and then it at here it, it it starts moving again, and most of this bump is after, and it finally again it starts here, it ends there, almost like again. The, the eclipse didn't even happen, but you have these bumps that you can't explain. Now, I have a book that was given to me by Hector Munera. He edited this book. It's called uh, Should the Laws of Gravitation Be Reconsidered? And he's honoring Maurice Allais. That's his picture. Uh, and there's a picture in the book of, uh, of him and a couple other people together, Maurice uh, uh, knew, I mean, Hector knew Maurice, and, uh, and it didn't work with him so much as he uh, uh, in, in, interacted and, and talked about these eclipses. Martin Kokos uh, is a, one of the uh, people who wrote a, an article in there, and, and he's, he, re, he says at the end of the preface, the collected papers in this book not only answer a resounding yes, that the laws should be reconsidered, but go a long way in suggesting how the laws should be rewritten and what future gravity theories might look like. It's an interesting book. Uh, one of the things that's in that book is a table, table of uh, 72, on page 72, and I have it marked here, and uh, I'm gonna show you there's a chart if I can get it to do right. There's a chart, I'm not asking you, but there's 19 entries in this chart. 
meaning there were 19 examples of people who did serious experiments during an eclipse. There is a person leading the group, and there are 15 different groups, although I'm not sure even that the groups are the same makeup. Obviously, Alay is two of these, and, and, and Wang is, is one of these 19. The, these experiments happened between 1954 and 2006. They happened in nine different countries. And they had used different devices. Twelve of them used pendulums, four used gravimeters, one used water level. They measured the water level during an eclipse, and one used an atomic clock to see whether the clock would speed up or slow down during an eclipse. And the chart re uh, gives you results. Six of them had no effect. Three of them said, maybe, I think, maybe I got one. It, it, it got enough to, to at least discuss the possibility, but 10 of them, 10 of the 19 said, yes, I got an effect uh, during my uh, experiment during the eclipse. Well, in 2012, at, at, at the NPA, that was back when we had the NPA, I wrote a paper on the Wang eclipse, and I used the uh, lay anomaly as, as a reference during that. And this is a drawing from that paper. And what I suggested is that you might be able to explain the bumps because people ignore the corona or the halo of the eclipse. What I suggested at that time was that there's shielding through the corona and the halo through the moon, which reduces the amount of force, What which would, may appear before the first contact, although this shows first contact, uh, you might get some effect before because of the of the halo because you you don't watch that you're not paying attention and, it, and its outline is rather irregular same thing at the other end and so i was saying the probably that's the cause it was the halo and it was the shielding i also suggested that we could calculate using the bumps we might be able to calculate the mass the effective the average mass of the halo versus the ma mass of the uh, main sun of course the total has to be the same Regardless, I, I issued the uh, paper and made the talk. There are things to consider during, uh, the, one of the reasons it's so difficult is there's so many different things that you need to consider or, or can affect what's going to happen, how much it happens. What are the distances to the sun and the moon at the time? Uh, where are you on the planet Earth? Uh, nine different countries and and, uh, and uh, you need to con I think you need to most people don't consider the halo, the corona and the halo as part of what's going on with the eclipse the percent eclipse we got three examples well 35 percent in uh, 59 67 uh, percent in 54 for a lay and we got a total eclipse for Wang in 1997. And then there's sort of other things like solar flare, flares, what's, what, what's going on when this when there's a solar flare and it spurts out. Uh, there's no reported flare, but those could affect it. Air temperature can affect it. Under the eclipse, when we get in the shadow, both the penumbra and the umbra of the, the shadow Air temperature drops. Air temperature drops, the density of air increases. That's a, that can affect the gravitational force. You have ocean and continental tides uh, moving. Uh, I had one person, uh, when I was giving some of the talk, really was heavy on the, cotton, the fact that the continent itself moved up. Uh, and when continents move up, uh, California gets real nervous because uh, during a, uh, an eclipse in California, the effect on the San Andreas Fault could be devastating. I use shielding. I use corona and halo. I use shielding as, and try to explain it. Since then, since then, in, uh, starting in, in 2015, I now have some other ways to explain it. 
of course, we had I had gravity. G1 is Newtonian gravity, but I didn't have G2 gravity. And so the next time I'm going to use the corona, the halo, the shielding, and the, both gravities to uh, try to explain these in a little bit more detail. My name is Bob D. Hilster, and I am your particle model guru. Tune in next time when I explain more of the universe using the particle model. Thank you for your attention.